Welcome to the Duck Pin Podcast with your host, Brian Griffiths. And now, here's Brian. One of the things we've been talking about here at the Duck Pin has been the upcoming elections here in the state of Maryland. One of the many candidates who will be on the ballot next year is my friend, State Senator Mike Huff, who will be running for county executive. Senator, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Well, thanks for joining us here on this week's show. We'll start with some of the Senate stuff first. This uh, past session um, was your first session as the Senate Minority Whip. You took over that position um, working under Senate Minority Leader Brian Simonair. Tell us a little bit about your experiences this year as the whip and just some of your impressions about the 2021 um, legislative session. Well, it was, a, it was a rough session. It reminds me a bit of um, O'Malley's seventh year when I was in the Maryland House at that time. And generally, when you're a year out from the election, so you're in the third year, the, the folks, the veterans around the General Assembly, the Democrat leadership knows that this is their year where they're going to pass something that would be unpopular or cause them problems in an election, that they'll pass it in this year and not try to do it in an election year. So uh, in that seventh year of O'Malley's term, it was tax increase after tax increase after tax increase. Uh, this year is really just uh, bad bills dealing with public safety. So a really anti-police package. It was a real shame. We worked really hard in the Senate. We actually produced, uh, you know, over a half dozen bills and the majority of them were unanimous, bipartisan. There was agreement uh, that we put together a good package. We'd work with the police. We'd worked with all sides. It was actually a, a, a great achievement. Whatever the House, the House basically uh, had a bunch of protesters come down and folks from the far left and, you know, the, the, basically the defund the police type folks, ACLU, they caved into that pressure. They sent back a package over that was very anti-police. that was dramatically different. And unfortunately, the Senate capitulated uh, the Democrat leadership. The Republicans didn't and passed that. Uh, the governor vetoed it, but it still went into effect. But it wasn't just the police. I mean, it was also... Uh, bill after bill that was decreasing sentences for violent offenders. I mean, we had legislation that uh, said that if you are a juvenile offender, that you cannot be sentenced to life without parole. I found that particularly offensive because uh, we ha actually have the, uh, um, uh, the Beltway sniper who committed those horrendous uh, offenses in, actually he was arrested in my district in Myersville. And uh, he had, you know, committed havoc, especially through Montgomery County for days and days, basically a domestic terrorist. And he is right now serving uh, his partner was as actually was executed because he went to Virginia and then he's serving time in Virginia. But Virginia passed the same thing. So long story short, uh, this individual is going to be coming up to Maryland and they can get a parole hearing now. And so Maryland said, no matter what the crime if you sexually assault a bunch of children and murder them, no matter what the heinous defense are, is, there's no life without parole if you were 17 and a half at the time you committed it. And there was just a bunch of uh, uh, pieces of legislation like that that dealt with, um, you know, uh, they redid the sentences for murder and other things like that. But people who are violent offenders, the worst of the worst, not only did we attack the police, but we pa passed a bunch of legislation that will decrease sentences for very violent offenders. And I think it was... Uh, it was shocking to see that because I've always been somebody that has worked collaboratively on criminal justice reform. We've you know, done a lot of bipartisan reforms in Maryland. Maryland's been a leader on criminal justice reform, but this was not dealing with nonviolent offenders. This was the violent worst of the worst. So I would say uh, to wrap things up, the O'Malley, the seventh year, in my opinion, was the total tax and spend craziness session. This was the most pro-criminal session I think the, the state of Maryland's ever had. And we're already seeing, not surprisingly, the uh, effects of that when we look at Baltimore City. Yeah, I mean, they were they were told this was going to happen, and 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 they act. Everybody's acting surprised that the criminal uh, the criminals in Maryland have reacted to what what was passed. It's 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 madness. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And we had a crime bill. You know, I worked with the governor. It's the second year in a row that we had a bill targeting specifically people who are repeat offenders with guns. So people who are uh, buying guns illegally, selling guns illegally, selling them on the street. You know, Maryland has passed all this gun control over the years and the murder rate is continuing to increase because criminals don't care. They're ignoring all these laws. They're not getting handgun qualification, license, concealed carry permits, all that. They're buying the guns illegally, they're carrying them illegally and they're committing crimes with them. We know that for a fact. 
And so we put in, I partnered with Governor Hogan and we've done legislation two years in a row to target those people who are repeat offenders with guns, repeat offenders who are violently attacking citizens. And uh, that legislation has twice passed the Senate and they won't even give me a, a courtesy of a hearing in the Maryland House. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, we, we've talked about this before. Um, you know, how the, how the Democrats in the General Assembly, they, they want to target gun owners. They just don't want to target the bad guys doing stuff with the guns. And it's appalling. It really uh, and truly is. You've got one more session left in the General Assembly, one more regular session. Let me say that because there might be a special session coming this fall, this December in particular, regarding redistricting. Obviously, being part of Senate leadership, uh, what do you know about the likelihood or the potentiality of a special session dealing with redistricting this December? Yeah, so we've already been notified that there'll most likely be a special session in December to deal with the congressional maps. And so, you know, we'll see what happens there. I was I was in the Maryland House and helped lead the effort uh, 10 years ago when we dealt with this. And, um, you know, my faith in the General Assembly to do the right thing when it comes to uh, redistricting is very low, just because I've, I've seen it. I mean, they, the map that we have now is one of the most gerrymandered in the country. If you drew Maryland fairly on the congressional level, you would have five Democrats, three Republicans. So Democrats would still be in the majority. But now we have the 7-1 map where you've got Congressman Harris as the lone Republican. His district's from the Eastern Shore all the way over to Carroll County. So they've packed every Republican they can and, and split things up. So I would imagine at a minimum, they put in a 7-1 map. Maybe they even try to go worse than that. I know Governor Hogan actually is doing something novel. People will agree with. He's having citizens, not politicians, draw the maps, actually allowing citizens to, have, and it's very common sense to draw these congressional maps. You just don't take counties like Frederick County and cut them in half. Right now, Frederick County is represented by two individuals from Montgomery County. And so, uh, you know, I think there'll be a contrast there for voters to see where Governor Hogan's going to have fair maps that make sense, that have people Western Maryland geographically together, the Eastern Shore, that, that makes geographic sense, makes sense. And so uh, I, I think at the end of the day, this is all going to end up being litigated. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, obviously, the governor's mm -hmm. maps are going to look sane and the Democrats' maps are going to look drawn by computer to maximize uh, to maximize Democrats uh, in yeah. the district and Democratic wins. Let's talk more uh, a little bit about the race for county executives, one of the reasons we have you here on this week's show. Um, for those who don't know, you've served a full term in the House of Delegates, two terms in the state Senate. What made you decide that you wanted to run to be Frederick County's next executive? Well, I think it's very important serving the General Assembly. I'll just say that in the, out, in the outset. And so I think the future of Maryland is, you know, it, it's really at stake in these next couple of elect, in this next election. Uh, I think it's very important. And I was proud that in the Senate, we worked, especially on the political end, you know, to start raising money in the slate and, you know, and start working on that. Because right now in Maryland, you've got 15 Republicans. You need to get another four so that you can filibuster. That you, there's a lot of things you can do that, to prevent bad legislation. Because We've had a Republican governor, uh, obviously, for the last eight years. So it's required the Democrats to have a supermajority to pass something, because if he vetoes it, they have to have enough to override it. If we don't have another Republican governor, which, of course, I hope we do, the Senate can be the one that can stop that. So I'll just put that out first. But with that being said, I love Frederick County. It's been my home my whole adulthood, uh, with the exception I did grow up in Montgomery County. And, and it's an important point because I grew up in central Montgomery County. And what I don't wanna see is uh, the bad decisions that happen in Montgomery County. And the reason that people are flocking to Frederick County is because of the over congestion, the crime, the high taxation, uh, it's really some of the bad development growth decisions that they made in Montgomery County. I don't wanna see that happen to Frederick County. I'd like to stay in Frederick County. I'd like to have my children have the opportunity to purchase a house here. And I just think this next election is uh, is of the utmost importance for the future of Frederick County. We are now a 50-50 county. We used to be a uber Republican red county. We actually now lean a couple points uh, to the to the Democrat side. So, and the folks that are running, and that was really the the thing that I looked at. I looked at the folks on the Democrat side. We've got uh, Jan Gardner, who's the current Democrat. She's been the county executive for eight years. 
my gosh, she looks so moderate compared to the people who are running. We've got one guy, uh, Kai Hagan, who's like a Bernie Sanders supporter. We got another one who was Elizabeth Warren supporter. So these, this is the new uh, wing of the Democrat Party we're seeing here, the real far left uh, radical wing here. And I don't think that's where Frederick County's at. I think they're more in the middle. And I don't think, and I know that they, they do not want to become Montgomery County North and see the bad decisions there really, you know, uh, uh, replicate it in our county and destroy our county. So that's why I felt it was important that we have a strong candidate uh, with a good message and that uh, on the Republican side and can win this thing. Because um, I think otherwise, somebody from the far left that basically from the city of Frederick South, you might as well just annex it and, you know, it'll become Montgomery County North. Yeah, you mentioned that about the Democrats who are who are running for county executive in, in this election, how Jan Gardner herself, very liberal, looks like you said like a conservative yeah. democrat basically compared to this crowd you know frederick has been friendly to democrats in the past but they've been more conservative democrats certainly um do you think that we can attribute this leftward shift in the frederick democratic party to the influx of voters from montgomery county or do you think there's something a little more something a little more to it yes there's probably some of that um but I would say overall, I mean, it's part and parcel just being in the General Assembly and, and seeing how much it's changed. I mean, even last term, we had a lot of blue dog and moderate Democrats that you could work with constructively. I mean, even on my committee, uh, actually, I had my kickoff event and uh, my former chairman, Bobby Zirkin, who was a moderate Democrat, he just he showed up and gave a nice speech about me to the crowd, to, you know, told him how we'd work together in a bipartisan fashion. And so... Uh, it's just been, I think, the Democrat Party nationally, we've totally seen in the General Assembly, seen in Frederick County, has really been pushed uh, much further to the left. I mean, if you even look at, at Joe Biden now, I mean, it's just shocking to see somebody who, look, he was never, a, I don't even know calling him moderate, but he certainly was moderate on some issues. But now, my gosh, he's just turned over so much of his uh, decision making and his policy he just looks more like Bernie Sanders than it does look like uh, you know, Biden or even Obama. Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree there. What are some of the issues, some of the focuses that you're going to put on the campaign? What issues are kind of the, you know, at the forefront of, uh, of what you're going to campaign on to the voters of Frederick County? Well, I've spent the last eight years on judicial proceedings. I have a, a long history when it comes to criminal justice issues. And so I think criminal justice issues are going to be, are going to be important in Frederick County. We're a growing county. We're seeing crime more and more, unfortunately. We're seeing stories of you know, drug trafficking and murder, things that are, were foreign to Frederick County a couple of years ago. So I think it's important that we have somebody that supports our sheriff. Uh, sheriff Chuck Jenkins has endorsed me. He's doing a great job. And he runs a, uh, 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 his program um, you know, that basically is removing people who are uh, in the, or, or partnering with ICE. He partners with ICE on the 287G program. And what that basically means is people who are here illegally and that ICE wants so that they can have an immigration uh, uh, detainer lodged on them. And they basically just want to have them for a hearing, have an immigration hearing on them. Most of these people came in the country illegally. They skipped out on their hearing. Uh, and so now they're at large in the community and they're here committing crimes. And so the sheriff has picked them up for committing other crimes. And during the booking process, they see they're here illegally. Long story short, on the Democrat side, those folks have been auditing, going after the sheriff, criticizing him, and they basically made it pretty clear that if they get in office, they'll end his 287G, they'll work to end the 287G program, take away power from the sheriff, and I don't want to see that. I want to support our law enforcement. I've been a strong supporter of law enforcement, make sure they're fully funded, you know, and uh, so I think criminal justice will be important. Oh, on the issue I see behind you, you've got looks like uh, some traffic roadway uh, uh, congestion there. Congestion is a huge issue in Frederick County. Um, and I've been a supporter of Governor Hogan's plan to widen 270. I think he needs a partner there to work with him on that. So obviously he won't be there for the next governor. We need to continue to push that. It's very important um, and continue to work on reducing uh, traffic congestion in the county. That's a major issue. Uh, and then two other things I'll talk about. Uh, on the issue of growth, we need to have balanced growth in our county. People want to come to Frederick County. We're strategically located close to Washington, D.C., which is a positive. But on the other side, uh, if we don't have a, a balanced approach to it, we've got to make sure to preserve our, our farmland, our heritage, 
the things that make Frederick County great. So there's there's got to be a balance between making house housing available and affordable. People want to come here, but at the same time, not paving over the whole county. And uh, lastly, on the issue of uh, uh, of fis fiscal issues, um, the county's budget has grown tremendously. Uh, in fact, it, uh, in the last three years alone, uh, it's grown by over 20%. And so that's a huge amount of growth because the, the county's population hasn't even barely grown that much in the last 10 years. So I think we need to get our spending under control and we can provide some tax relief in return to Frederick County residents. And the first thing I, we can do, and it's well within the Republicans on the council have been trying. In fact, last, uh, last budget season, they made a valiant effort. Unfortunately, they don't have the votes. They're one seat out of the majority, which was to freeze property taxes and and this is the rate that the amount that you actually pay. So I won't get into the whole constant yield argument, whatever, but basically the amount that people actually pay to freeze that and also looking at reducing the income tax rate that people pay. So I think if you did those with those kind of measures and some other regulatory changes and just letting people know that Frederick County is open for business, we want to help small business owners, uh, you provide tax relief. I think that'll be a huge incentive for folks to continue to come here. Yeah, you're definitely right. It is a challenge to balance to balance the growth, at, you know, with with preserving what's there, and I think that's at the crux of a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of the challenges that Frederick County faces. You know, I, I obviously we both remember when Frederick County was much more rural than it is now, but it has, but the growth that's there, it's made it much more competitive economically. You know, how do you do it? I mean, obviously, you know, it, you know, it's it's easy to, to to say that we're going to do it, but how can we? What concrete steps? can be taken to make sure because I am I am very, you know, obviously Frederick County is not my county, but here in Anne Arundel County, I've been very um, hold the line on on growth, even reduce growth, reduce, reduce yeah. growth rather. How do we actually put something like that into place using uh, our conservative principles? Well, there's a couple of things in that. So you've got an area like Frederick County and you have got farmers. You've got to work with the farmers to preserve that land. And that means uh, providing the farmers money to be able to stay there and put in what's called ag preservation. So we've got to make sure from a county level that we're funding that. That's actually one thing I think is very bipartisan because the current county executive has laid out a plan to preserve 100,000 acres of farmland. Uh, and I'm fully in support of that. Now that means with the budget and there's things we're going to have to do to make sure that farmers have that support. Because let's face it, when you're in an area and there's pressure for development, uh, there's a great incentive to turn that over to development. And so unless we can offer them an incentive monetarily to stay there and not turn it over. So I think that's number one. Number two, we've got to work with municipalities so that uh, municipalities, if they're building, if they're, they're putting in developments that are going to cause overcrowding schools, we really have to work with them. And I'd like to say work with them in a positive way, not, not in a negative way, but work with them in a non-punitive fashion uh, so that we don't end up with that result, because I don't think the county wants, we don't want to be in the business of building schools for uh, municipalities that uh, put themselves in a position where the school is going to be, you know, they, school, kids are languishing in 120, 130% capacity. So I think that's very important. And then looking at basically the, uh, the densities in the county, I, I don't think we should have anything in the county that resembles like a Silver Spring type density level. So um, so that, that's, that's sort of what I see as right now outside of the zoning and everything else is, is the way that, um, uh, the path forward and we're going to be putting out a plan here in the next couple of weeks, you know, I'd say months, no one's paying attention other than you and me, Brian, and some, <laughs> not a lot of you are paying attention right now. So, but we are working on a, a solid plan on, you know, uh, development in the County and how to strike that balance. But in the, and, and I think it's, it's a very important issue because Frederick County, there's a lot of growth that's already in the pipeline. So it was already approved previous boards. And, but going forward, we have to decide what kind of county we're gonna be. And the Democrat model is very simple. From the city of Frederick to like Rockville, create one giant megalopolis. And I don't want to. I don't want to see that. I. I just. I don't think that's the correct way to to go about it. And I think we can have a more balanced, uh, better way to to having it. And in the same token, though, too. Uh, you know, for the developments that are that are approved, and for other projects, and you know, 
a lot of it's just small developers that are, you know, building an addition on a home or something like that. Uh, making sure that we're working with people and that we have a permitting process and everything that makes sense that we're not, uh, you know, needlessly dragging, uh, you know, delays because when you do that uh, and you have unnecessary fees and, you know, you're, when the, when the permitting process, those kind of problems, it does increase the, the cost of homes and adds an unnecessary, uh, makes it more unaffordable. So make sure we do have some government, good government efficiency as far as working with people and permitting and the business process. Yeah, I can't imagine that the 270 corridor, especially when you get south of Frederick there up towards the Montgomery County line, I can't imagine that the topography or the infrastructure are, are conducive to that sort of that sort of large scale development just from my limited time kind of driving that corridor. So I can definitely agree with, uh, with, with, with what you said there. One of the challenges, and you've experienced this firsthand over the course of your political career, one of the challenges for any Frederick County Republican is navigating the minefield that is Republican politics in Frederick County. Uh, your, uh, when you sought the appointment to a vacant seat in 2009, when you ran in 2010, when you ran in 2014, a lot of acrimony uh, between different factions of uh, of the party, and a lot of that acrimony still exists both in front of the camera, behind the camera, if you will, today. How can you um, kind of bring everybody together into the same room, pulling towards the same rope, towards the one goal, that goal of getting uh, a Republican, particularly you, elected county executive next year? I'd say so far it's it's been great, and uh, unfortunately, being becoming the minority party in Frederick County has helped quash a lot of the inner party fighting, at least for our county, because I think there's a realization that this might be our last best chance to uh, retake county government, and that if we are if we are divided, we can't do that. So right now, I'm the only Republican running. There's nobody else who's I, that's even at the moment openly talking about it. Um, and so there's been great unity. I mean, uh, even at my kickoff event, I had Republicans from all the different clubs who were there. I had, you know, almost all the elected officials, Republican elected officials in the county were there. So I think there is an understanding that <clears throat> we are now, because of the registration numbers, the slight minority uh, party. And so we really got to be united. We go in the football game, probably at least down a field goal. And so let's all stick together and, uh, you know, we can win this. But so far, I mean, it's been uh, the, in, I'd say the infighting or any of that has, it's uh, been at a complete minimum. And, and the infighting is, it looks like it's all on their side because there's three Democrats who are running in the primary. And so uh, uh, we're f so far so good. <laughs> you made a football analogy. Let's talk about some fun stuff. Um, you made a football analogy and you're a big fan of that Washington football team. And I don't hold it against you as a Ravens fan, <laughs> even though we're better. Um, I can't argue that. You, <laughs> you guys are still lacking a name. If it yeah. was, if you owned the team, well, if you owned the team, you probably wouldn't be running for county executive. But yeah. uh, if you owned the team and the choice was yours, what would the new name of the team be? Well, you know, I was, I was, I did not like that they didn't, that they gave up on the idea of warriors. They said, well, that's like the, um, that could be Native American. I thought, well, no, I don't, I mean, warrior is, you know, that to me, that could be anything, you know. Especially since Snyder has owned the trademark for like 18 years or something. Yeah, like then he, he sold it, I guess, right beforehand. So I thought that would have fit Washington warriors and uh, uh, maybe you could have figured out a way to keep the fight song or something like that. I don't, there's a couple things I, I want. A, I don't like their helmets at all. They look, they look worse. The Brunswick Junior Railroaders have a much <laughs> than the Washington Redskins. They are Washington football team. They don't even have the stripe anymore. There's like some electrical tape looking numbers. The helmet is terrible. I don't like that. I don't like the Red Wolves that people are putting out. To me, that sounds really? like a high school. Yeah, it sounds like a high school football team. There's not wolves running around this area. I guess in North Carolina, maybe there's some red wolves or something, but it sounds like a, like a high school, I don't know, a uh, football team or something like that. So I don't know. I don't really have a strong preference. I hate to say it, but I don't want red wolves or something that sounds like we're, we should be playing in JV football or something. Of all the questions the politician dodges the answer on, it's this one. That's, that's, that's know, fun. It's, it's hard for me, you know, because uh, I thought that uh, I, I really like 
not even just the Redskins, but the logo. There's a beautiful logo, and it was actually designed after a uh, Native American chief. Uh, they, they, it was done by Native American artists. Beautiful logo, and it's just I think the whole thing is a shame what what they did, but it is what it is. Okay, well, um, there's a team up the road with a with a name. Then we're pretty good. So you can always, you <laughs> well, can if always. Keep, if, we keep, if we keep losers, what's the, the, uh, the, uh, what was it, the generals or what was the one that Harlem Globetrotters <laughs> always defeated? Yeah, it was the, it was the generals. But actually, if you, <laughs> if you remember, there was also a team in the USFL, the Federals, which were also, the Washington Federals, which were also the worst team in the league. So, um, hey, we could be the Bullets. That's available. <laughs> <laughs> It, it sure is. And there's a basketball team that should have never changed their name from that. But that's another story. Another um, great uniform, too, by the way. And another yeah. team that was stolen from Baltimore. Not that I'm bitter about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one last uh, one last topic we'll talk about here today. And I think that not a lot of people actually know this about you um, is that you're a musician. Uh -oh. um, you know, there is something, you know, I've I've always wanted to learn to play an instrument and I, I have that terrible fingers and no rhythm. So I'm, I can't really do it very well. Um, so tell, you know, tell us about your music career. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it much of a career. Uh, so for my 40th birthday party, uh, I did a big fundraiser for that. And uh, I wanted to, a friend of mine, his, his, his son is a great drummer. Absolutely excellent. And I said, hey, what? And he plays guitar. I said, hey, why don't we get together? We'll play a couple songs live because when I was in high school, I used to play a lot and uh, play a lot in bands. I played guitar and believe it or not, would sing and all that stuff. And just a hobby in high school. We used to go around and play a couple little places in Rockville and Gavisburg. But uh, I said, let's get together and we'll uh, we'll do it. And long story short, uh, we played a couple so songs at my 40th birthday party. And, you know, COVID hit. And it was a great thing to do. A couple of us in the neighborhood got together and one thing leads to another. And then we find a, a great singer from Frederick. So we've got this great band that we've been playing in a basement for like two years because of COVID and everything else. But we're supposed to be playing uh, in uh, Brunswick on September 10th in the uh, downtown. So we'll be uh, we'll be out playing at that. And so it's just a fun hobby. And my my buddy who's on the Brunswick City Council Von Ripley is in the band. So we call ourselves no politics. So it's just music, no politics. In fact, I don't even know what the other band members, what their affiliations or any of that are, because we never talk politics. It's just music. So mostly play, uh, you know, classic rock, Tom Petty, stuff like that, some country. So um, I guess people in the area on the evening, September 10th, stop on by downtown Brunswick. We'll be playing a couple of tunes. If only there were other, every other band, we didn't know their politics either. So let me ask if you guys, yeah. Assuming you win, you guys play the victory party. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll have to keep. We'll have to hold you to that one. Uh, <laughs> if folks want to reach out more information about your campaign, how can they do that? So my website is mikeforfrederick.com. You can email me at mikeforfrederick.com, and I'm on Facebook. The last name, I'm sure you got to have it up there, but it's H O U G H. So it's Huff, uh, and it's. I tell people it's like rough or tough. So like tough on taxes. So vote for me. I won't raise your taxes. Perfect. Well, State Senator Mike Huff running for county executive. You've got my support uh, and hope everybody else uh, gets out and uh, supports you too. Best of luck. We'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, thank you. This has been the Duckpin Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and download.